this analyst class, I learned about how missionaries go around places and they talk about Jesus and they spread the world word. I like the part whenever she teaches us about the kids that live around the world and tell us about them. I think mission education is important because uh, Matthew 28, 19, and 20 tells us to go and to be missionaries. And it gives somebody an avenue for the Holy Spirit to touch them and say, here's what we want you to do. I want you to go overseas. I want you to go home to Kentwood. I want you to go on the field. Missions education gives them what they need in order to make those decisions. I was in uh, GAs when I was a little girl. My daughter was in GAs and ACT Teens. And through the ACT Teens, my daughter was really encouraged in the area of missions. And it was through these missions education programs that I really began to learn about the need for missionaries, about what missionaries did. I began to get a bigger view of the world and to hear about people who needed to know about Christ. Um, there were huge letters on the wall that said, pray, give, go. And I realized that for a long time I had been praying for missions and that I had been giving towards missions, but I had never considered my willingness to go. Last year when we heard about MJM, I had no idea really what to expect except what the brochure said. A child may not go to church, but if they happen to be invited to go to MJM, that may be the only way that they ever hear about Jesus. Last year I saw a bunch of different people that I didn't know from New Orleans and I learned all about Jesus. The missions training that the kids received there had impacted their lives in such a big way in such a short period of time. You could tell that their lives were changing. And in the next few weeks, six of my children made professions of faith. The following Sunday, she actually ran the preacher down at church and said, I'm coming up the aisle. After MJM last year, I talked to Mr. Jean about I, want, I wanted Jesus to come in my heart. And I'm just very thankful that people give to support missions. Missions is very, very necessary. Well, good morning, church. It is good to see you as they get the lights back on because it's hard to see some of you. Now, some of you I didn't want to see anyway, but uh, I'm just kidding. I, I was talking, he wasn't in here yet, so I had to make fun. Would y'all stand together? Good to see you, bro. Would y'all stand together? Let's worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Aren't you glad he calls us a friend this morning? Amen. Let's sing this. Put your hands together. And who am I that you? Oh, it's amazing, crossing out, and I am a friend of 
this morning. God Almighty is the Lord of glory. You have called me friend. He's God Almighty, the Lord.
I love that song. Amen. And every time I sing and hear that song, I'm reminded of Psalms 150. And it talks about everything, all the musical instruments, everything is to be used to bring glory to the Father. But then it says this, let everything that has what? Breath. Now, if you're standing up, or if you're sitting down, <laughs> you have breath in your lungs today. And the Bible commands us that we are to praise the Lord. Now, watch this. Has God done anything for you lately? Amen. I mean, just the very fact that we got up this morning. Ought to be enough reason for us to be grinning from ear to ear and say, Lord, <laughs> thank you for another awesome day. Amen. That's what this worship is about today. Is to honor, to exalt our Savior and to praise his name. God inhabits the praise of who? His people. His people. So you don't forget that this morning. You worship the Lord. Well, we're glad that you're here today. And it's good to see you here today in the Lord's house. And especially the guests that are here today. What an honor that you've chosen to come and worship with us today here at Milldale. Please take a moment to fill out the card that is attached to your worship bulletin. I'd just like to have a record of your attendance with us this morning. Now, we love to fellowship, so Milldale, turn around. Hey, we love, hey, Miss Margie Kilcrease, it is a wild joy to see you today. We buried her husband this week, and here she is in the Lord's house today. So find someone, hug next, make everyone welcome in our service this morning.
says as God would you ambush us would you fill this place with your presence so let's sing this together who can satisfy and who can satisfy my soul like you and who on earth could comfort me and love me like you do and who
That's my last week here. I wanted to do a song that I started with here. The first song I introduced to you, How Great Is Our God. And I wanted to end with that as well. You know, when we came, I was asked to bring us to a blended service. And that's the easiest song to start with because it's so true. It's so simple, but it's so true. In every situation, he's great. In all things, he's great. And I tell you, if we don't cry out to him, if we don't praise him, the very creation he created will. But I don't want a rock praising him for me. Amen? I don't want some grass giving him praise in my place. Because he, deserve, he deserves my praise. Because he's been good to me. He created the earth, but he hasn't necessarily been good to him. He hasn't blessed the earth. He blessed us. He's given us life everlasting. Amen? And so I want to end this, end my time with y'all here with this song, How Great Is Our God, for the splendor of the King. I hope we never get past his splendor and his wonder, his awe. I hope we stay hungry for him. Amen? Let's sing. The splendor of the King. Gold in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. Sing it together.
God, and all will see how great, how great the Lord. Lord, I hope we never get over that. Father, I pray we'll never get past how good you are to us. So, Father, in this time, would you speak? Would you move? And would your presence so fill this place? And, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that every spirit that is not of the Holy Spirit has to be escorted out in Jesus' name. For this is your house. We are your people. So, Father, whatever care and burdens that we have come into this place with this morning, Father, would you help us to give them to you? Could we lay them at the altar and say, God, I give in, I surrender all. Would you take my messed up self, all my issues, and you do as you see fit? Father, I thank you for what a blessing it's been to serve here as a music minister. Father, I thank you. It has been such an honor, been a privilege of my life to be here. And so, Father, I pray that you would do what you need to in the life of this church to grow us, to convict us of our sins so that we can be as right with you as we know how. And, Father, when all is said and done, all we can say is glory to God. How great you are. In Jesus' name, amen. My hope for the country is bright because once we reach the children and the youth with the gospel, we have a bright future. The box represents not only what somebody's going to be receiving, but what somebody is giving. I think the the vision of, of the church is that each person matters to God and each person matters to us. And so the way that we communicate to people that they matter is, uh, is, with, is with kindness. Gift boxes have been a blessing in more ways than one. It was easy then to preach that Jesus cares. It was easy to show them that Jesus really loves you. And this is only a small way in which he's demonstrating his love. One of the amazing things about Operation Christmas Child is that we uh, do our mission in a tangible way to needed children around the globe and together with the local church. And that is a very critical part. It is by empowering, by entrusting, by training uh, the local church, children are important for God because it brings God's name forward. It brings the name of Jesus Christ forward. It's getting people locally to think globally. It's a simple way for people to think about the world and not just think about it, but actually do something. Well, amen. I hope you're praying about that and that you will be prepared to sponsor several Christmas boxes this year for Operation Operation Christmas Child. Now, I think our goal, I think they first told me 150, and I said, no, we can do better than that. I think our goal now is going to be at least 200. We can do 200 boxes. I mean, come on. That's the least that we can do. Well, there is absolutely no substitute for 2020 vision, whether it's corrected or uncorrected, everyone, I think, would agree, we like to see things, and we like to see things clearly. I tell you, that's not only true in the physical realm, but it's especially true in the spiritual realm. I, I was thinking the other day, listen to me. Well, we've been talking about getting personal with God. I, I, I want to have a walk with God in such a way. I, I was praying the other day. I was sitting out back here in our prayer garden area, and I was actually sitting in the swing there at the foot of the cross, Brother Kennedy, that we got back there. And 
I was just thinking, boy, Lord, I would love to have an encounter the way Moses had. I'd just love to be in the presence of a burning bush. Come on, y'all. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, okay, Lord, now which one of these bushes are you going to... And let me see your presence. And all of a sudden, it was like the Holy Spirit just slapped me upside my head. He said, son, you're in my presence. I, I want to be, as I said two weeks ago when I started this series of messages, when Isaiah saw over into heaven, it was like that he could hear a conversation going on with the Holy Trinity. I, I want to be able to see God, and I want to be able, watch this, in terms of today's technology, I really want to be able to see God in HD. I want to hear God in surround sound, or whatever they call that. And God says, as much as you want to see me, and as much as you want to hear from me, God says this morning, I want to see you. Amen. I want to hear from you. I ask you a question this morning, listen to me. Have you had time today with God? Have you heard already this morning from the Lord? I don't think that we should get up and get dressed to come here just so we can hear from God. I believe we need to hear from God before we get here. Uh, we, we got to have fellowship with Him so that we can fellowship with one another. We're talking about being close and personal with God. I, 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 listen, that's the kind of relationship that you and I can have today. You see, we serve a God that sent His Son to remove every barrier, Amen. to remove every obstacle, to bridge every gulf that we come up against. Oh, listen to me. Jesus came to unlock every door in my life. Jesus came so that he could have sweet fellowship with us seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Amen. In fact, I want to say this. You and I, this morning, right now, at this moment, at this part in our Christian walk, we ought to be closer to the Lord today than we are with anyone else. Amen. And if we're not, my friend, guess what? It's not his fault. God's still where he's always been. The only one that ever walks away from him is who? Us. So how's your walk this morning? Turn with me to Hebrews, the fourth chapter this morning, and we're going to look at some questions. We're going to look at some scriptures this morning that I feel like are eye-opening. The writer of the book of Hebrews, is actually writing to an audience of Jews. These Jews had become followers of Christ. They've given their heart and their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. And now these Jewish people are beginning to wonder, now, now that we're Christians, how will being a Christian affect my upbringing? How will my being a Christian now affect my Jewish heritage and, and the things that I was taught as a Jew. Did you know the Lord reminded me the other day when I was looking at this, you'll find more Old Testament quotes in the book of Hebrews than any other New Testament book. That's interesting, I think. When we come to the fourth chapter of Hebrews, the author of this awesome book writes something that I think would have made any religious Jew in that day gasp for air. I can almost 
see Paul as he's reading this text to those Jewish people, and, and probably everyone in the temple that day, their reaction was this. Like, oh, I can't believe what he just said. What did he say? Look at verse 14, Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. You see, here's why those Jews would have gasped for air. See, every good Jew knew that only the high priest was the, he's the only one allowed to get near to God. It was only the high priest who could come into the presence of a holy God. And then that was only when he stood in the holy of holies there at the altar. And, and that could only be done how often? Once a year. And that could only be done when? On the day of atonement. And now here is the Apostle Paul, perhaps I believe is who wrote Hebrews. Now, the author of Hebrews is standing before these Jewish people, and now here's what he's saying. He's saying, now you need to understand that Jesus lives in your heart. Jesus Christ is your high priest. Amen. Wow. Jesus He's your high priest, watch this, who has gone before us into heaven. Amen. All right, look at the next verse. And then he says in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. He's reminding these Jews that this high priest now that we serve, he's not, he's not an ordinary high priest. Yes, he's one, even though he is a, watch this, he's saying, he is one that although he is above us, he's also beside us. <laughs> Woo! He's not just in heaven, but he's also, but listen to what he was saying to those Jews was, our high priest at one time had skin on. Amen. Uh, you, you, you could really say about our high priest today, he had skin in the game. Why? Because he was a human being. Amen. And he did face every temptation that you and I would ever be faced with in our lifetime. And yet, he did not. Sin. Woo. And then he closes with the most incredible statement. Look what he says in verse 16. He says in verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly or draw near to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Hallelujah. I, I like that, the tense of the verb, I like the translation where it says, let us draw near. Because in the Greek, lang in the Greek language, that's in the present tense, so it means continuous action. So what the author of Hebrews is saying to these Jewish people that day is simply this. You don't have to go through the high priest anymore to get to God. Amen. I don't have to. The high priest no longer has to go into the holy of holies. Watch this. He was saying, hey, folk, now that Jesus lives in your heart, you can go to him as often as you like. And you can stay in his presence as long as you want to. And you can just open up and share anything that you want to with your high priest. <laughs> Woo! Come on, that ought to make us, we ought to be wanting to shout right now. If you're a follower of Christ, listen, you know what I'm about to say is true. 
And I tell you, the Holy Spirit got all over my heart this morning. I, I spent my whole Sunday school hour telling my class, I just got to be honest today. I just got to be honest today. Well, lo and behold, here I am now in the pulpit, and I got to be honest with you. Are you ready for this? Too often, we will go and we will get into the presence of a holy God because we're wanting God to do something for us. Too often we get into the presence of a holy God because we've got this long list of, of God, I want God, I want God, I need God. Watch this. Too often we come before him with our needs rather than coming into his presence just to listen. Am I telling the truth? Okay, if that's the truth then, I love you. I'm afraid one of the reasons And believe me, I've heard this. Listen, I've heard. I just don't hear God. Preacher, God's not answering my prayer. Here's the problem. Here it is. Watch this. The reason we don't hear from God is because we won't shut up long enough to let God speak. We're so busy asking, 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 asking that we can't hear God speak. Amen. Now, guess what? God still speaks. If we'll just listen. Amen. God speaks. The question is, are we listening? I believe that communication and conversation, it takes time. You see, it's important that every husband and wife communicate. Amen. I believe it's important for fathers to communicate to their sons, and, and moms need to communicate with their daughters. Amen. Are y'all with me so far? As important as that is, we need to have daily communication with the Father. Amen. We need to talk. Listen, the Father's got something to say. We need to communicate with Him. Now, call it whatever you will. Maybe it's quiet time. Maybe it's my devotional life. Maybe it's just time alone with God. I don't care what you call it. But here's the thing. We all need time with God. And God wants to have time with us. Amen. Do you enjoy spending time with your spouse? Amen. One man does. <laughs> I'm going to give you one more chance. Do you like spending time with your spouse? Do you communicate? One man does. <laughs> oh, his wife told him to say that. I got you. Okay. <laughs> we need to have time with God daily. You know, my wife left the other day. She, she went to North Alabama. Our daughter was having a sonogram. She's pregnant, and she wanted to be there. And, and she's been sent, spending some time with Miss Deanna. Well, I talked to her last night, and I said, are you having fun? She said, yes. I said, well, I'm not. <laughs> she said, you miss me? I said, yeah. And let me tell you something. You're not going nowhere else ever again. do well by myself. Amen. Now, some of you men may not listen, but the older I get, 
the worse it gets. I sent her this long text last night. I said, I just want you to know I'm in this dumb house, in this dumb bed, and I can't get no dumb sleep. <laughs> I was just trying to make a point. <laughs> Are y'all following me so far? See, just as I need that conversation and that relationship with my wife, I need it more so with the Father. I, I hope and pray that you've had that time with the Lord this moment. You see, except for my salvation experience, Nothing has impacted my life more than the time I've spent alone with the Lord. Amen. It's amazing when you get alone with God and God starts speaking. Listen to me, church. I mean, that's how I know what I'm supposed to preach. And Amen. I mean, I hear from God. It's amazing what God will show you. It's amazing what God will say if we'll just take the time to be still and to know that he's God. Amen. Amen. Here's my message this morning. I want to share with you how I spend my time with the Lord. This is no, in no, listen, I'm not saying this is the only way, and it's not the, I'm not saying it's the best way, but I just can tell you this morning, man, I hear from God. Amen. And I love having fellowship with Him. Amen. And so I just want to share with you just some simple things, because listen to me, I believe God wants us to get very close to Him. I believe God wants us to have a personal encounter with Him. Amen. And so there are certain things that has to happen in our lives if we're going to have that kind of intimacy with Him. So here's what I do. And I hope everybody's got something to write with. And I hope everybody's got a pen or pencil in their hand because, well, you'll understand in just a moment. Here's what God, here's how I walk with the Lord. First of all, you have to reserve a time and a place. You need to reserve yourself a, a time and a place. If you really want to connect with someone, and if you want to be able to communicate with that one, listen to this, environment is the key. Now, when I speak of an environment, here's what, I, here's what I'm talking about. You see, our environment is affected by two things, time and place. Time and place. Now, men, watch this. If I want to have a romantic meal with Penny, I don't take her to Waffle House. It's hard to get romantic with bacon sizzling in the background. <laughs> I don't take, if I want to have a romantic meal with my wife, or so rom listen, I don't take her to McDonald's. <laughs> Sitting there trying to have a romantic conversation with my wife and then hear him saying, about, you want large fries or small fries? <laughs> no, watch this. When I want to communicate, when I want to romance her, I take her to, to a nice place that has a, tablecloth on the table. Amen. It has a candle burning. <laughs> the lights are low. And the music is... Hello. <laughs> you fellas, if you hadn't tried it lately, you need to. Flemings. <laughs> Woo! Y'all are looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate this morning. Listen to me. If you've got something important to say to someone, 
if you want to engage in a deep conversation, you got to do it. Now watch this. You have to do it when there's peace and quiet. Amen. That's important. Amen. So, time and place are important. Lord, help us get this. Now, sometimes when I want to get along with the Lord, it's going to surprise you. You know what I do? I do this a lot. When I want to get away from the distractions of the world, when I want to get away or have to get away from all the distractions in the office, I come and I sit in this dark auditorium. I'll come in here and sit on the front row, or I'll come and I kneel at this altar during the day. Why? Because it's quiet. Amen. I can't have people around me. Just being honest. I can't have a lot of activity going on around me. You have to get away. You have to shut it out. Some days I walk across and sit under the crepe myrtles on one of the park benches. Some days I go to the back 40. Are y'all with? Are you listening to me? Last night, I just got out and walked around the property. It was dark. It was quiet. I'm t listen to. I got. Whoo. <laughs> I met with the Lord. Amen. Would you believe he's just, he's all over this property. How many times, oh, mercy me. I'm preaching to me right now more than I'm preaching to anybody. Don't ever forget this. Time is important. If you draw, if you're going to draw near to God, if I'm going to hear God speak, this is going to shock you. I have to be, watch, I have to schedule that kind of time. I do. I have to put it on my schedule. And I want to encourage all of you. Put it on your schedule. I mean, as you make out your schedule for this coming week, listen to me. Don't you neglect, don't you omit the most important schedule you have this coming week is your time alone with God. Amen. How many times... How many times have you said to a friend, we need to do lunch together? We need to go play golf together. We need to go fishing. And we don't ever do it. You know why? Because we didn't schedule it. Amen. We did not make it a priority. Now watch this. If I don't put time with God on my schedule every single day, let me tell you something. The devil will see to it that I'm so busy that I don't have time for my schedule. Y'all know what I'm talking about, amen? amen? One of the easiest things for me, and I'm not going to speak for you, but I got a feeling, if we'd all be honest, we all probably on the same page. One of the easiest things in my life to get squeezed out of my schedule every day is my quiet time. 
I'm telling you what, my day can be almost over with, and I realize, you know what? I didn't spend good time in prayer today. I didn't spend time in the Word today. I'm just so busy. I'm busy. And you know what? Here's what I told my class this morning. If we, we're much busier than what God wants us to be. Amen. If you're so busy that you don't have time for God, guess what, my friend? You're in trouble. You're in trouble. I want to make a suggestion. And again, this is not in concrete, but, and I'm not saying this is the only time, but I want to encourage you to do this. Your quiet time with the Lord, and this is for every single one of us, ought to be every morning. The time we spend with the Lord ought to be every morning. I mean, we've seen in the Scripture where Jesus did that. There, there had to be some method to his madness, amen? I mean, he knew that the only way that he could accomplish that day, what the Father wanted him to do that day, is he had to begin his day with his Father. In other words, before I can even get started today, i got to get along with my Heavenly Father to get His instructions for me for that day. Amen. I don't believe that God gives us a list of things to do for the week and say, okay, now do your best to get it done. No. I believe God gives us things one day at a time. Amen. And so we have to begin our day every day with the Lord. <laughs> I have a to-do list. Now, if I didn't have a to-do list, my, where, I don't know where I'd be. But the number one thing on my to-do list every day is to begin my day with King Jesus. Some of you this morning in this congregation, because I know, listen to me, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> I'm not a morning person. I don't do well in the morning. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. Every one of us do something first thing every morning. Everybody does something first thing every morning. I wonder what do you do the first thing every morning? Probably turn on the computer. Check your emails. Check to see if I got any text messages during the night. See what the latest rumor is on Facebook. All of us, every one of us, do something first thing Every morning. Amen. Be honest. Come on, church. You know what Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says? It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Since you're going to do something first every morning, you might as well start your day with the Lord. You, you, come on. But, but preacher, I'm just not my best in the morning. I'm just not sharp in the morning. Well, guess what? You and I might not be at our best early in the morning. We might not be the sharpest tack first thing in the morning, but God's always at his best. Amen. You, 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 well, I keep... I can't get my eyes open early in the morning. You know, the psalmist had the same problem. The Bible tells us, I want you to write this down, because here's one that, boy, we can put it up and put it on our refrigerator, or maybe the mirror in our bathroom. The psalmist said in Psalms 119, verse 18, he says, God, I can't open my eyes. Will you do it for me? <laughs> I mean, can you understand his heart? Maybe every morning we need to, 
Wake up and say, God, I'm struggling. I can't get my eyes open. God, would you open my eyes? And, and God, help me to have some time with you. What's your excuse? What's standing in your way? The second way to draw near to God is not only do you need to reserve a time and a place, but secondly, you need to read your Bible. You must read your Bible. The primary way that God speaks to his children is through his word. That's how God speaks. Now, I don't put God in a box, and I'm not saying that God can't speak some other way. But the primary way that God speaks to us, and he's been doing it for over 2,000 years, is he speaks to his children through the written word of God. If you're going to draw near to God, if you're going to have that intimate fellowship, that intimate relationship with God, listen to me, there's no way around this. You must study your Bible. You have to read the Word of God. Oh, God, there's no other way. Now, you, you can pray all you want to and talk to God all you want to, but listen, God is not going to speak to you unless he does it through his word. I can't tell you how many times I have prayed and, and sought God for something, and then an hour later or a day or two later, I'm studying something in the Scripture, and all of a sudden, it's like a light goes off, and I'm, wow, that's what I've been praying. See, that's the Holy Spirit opening my eyes to His Word. That's God speaking to me. Amen. Too often I hear people, well, preacher, I don't think my prayer is going any higher than the ceiling. You're telling on yourself. Because what you're telling me is you're not spending time in the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Come on, help me out. Now, I want to help you with something. There's all types of ways to read the Bible, and there's all kinds of Bible um, reading plans out there. Not long ago, I stumbled across this, but I want to give it to you. The next time you're online, I want you to look this site up. It is www.uversion.com. Uversion.com. And there you can find, it's amazing how many different Bible programs and different reading plans. And, I mean, you can have them sent to your computer. You can even have them, have them sent to your uh, through text message or email. They can come directly to your telephone. But listen to me. We all need to have time every day where we read something from God's Word. Amen. Now, for those who would say, well, I don't read my Bible very much. It's just difficult for me to read. Well, let me suggest that you do this. If nothing else, you need to read the Gospel of John. Or maybe you need to read the book of James. They're easy books to read. They're practical books. And, I'm, and I have no doubt, listen to me, if you'll just start reading the Gospel of John or the book of James, I have no doubt, I don't care who you are, the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart. Amen. The Holy Spirit will reveal things to you. Well, but pastor, when I do read, I've read, and I, and I just have a problem understanding what it is that I'm reading. I've, I read scriptures and I read chapters. I've read books. And pastor, I struggle. I just don't ever understand. Okay. Let's be honest. We've all been there. So here's what I want to suggest that you do. When you read your Bible, you should always ask three questions over those texts that you're reading. So as you read the Bible, here's the first question that you always ask about that Scripture. First of all, what does this passage say to me? What is this passage of Scripture saying to me? That's very simple. In other words, what's the message in this text, God, that you have for me? I like to ask myself when I'm reading, why did God put this in the Bible? What is the author of this book trying to say to me. 
And the second question that I always ask is this, what can I learn from it? What can I take from this passage of Scripture? In other words, as I read the Bible, I ask myself, is there a lesson for me to learn? Is there a warning here that I perhaps need to heed? Is there a principle in the Word that I must never, ever forget? third question that we should always ask every time we read the Bible is, how can I apply this truth to my life? How do I apply the truth to my life? Did you know every single story in the Bible is a story that shows us there's something that we ought to be doing, or it's a story about something that we should not do. Every story is like that in the Word of God. Let me give you an example. When you read, say, the book of Daniel, what does Daniel teach us? Well, it teaches us that we don't have to be afraid of lion's dens and fiery furnaces. Is that not what it teaches? Come on. Well, then you can read about the story of Samson. What does Samson teach us? Well, it teaches us not to marry the wrong woman. And dear Lord, don't dare let her give you a haircut. That's what I see when I read it. David. What do we learn when we read about the young King David? Well, David teaches me this. You can't cover sin up. Or you can't hide it from the Lord. You say, preacher... How do you remember all those things? I'm glad you asked that. It's real simple. You know how you remember? Well, that leads me to my third point here. Here's how we remember. We reserve a time and place. Second, we read our Bible. And thirdly, here's how I remember. You should always... I'm ta- Listen, nobody's exempt from this. You should always record your thoughts. Always record your thoughts. Now, here's what I mean. You need to write down what God is saying to you, and you all, every one of us, every man, every woman, every young person should have what I call a spiritual diary. You should have a spiritual diary where you record what God is doing. You record what God is saying. You write down what God is revealing to you. You say, now preacher, where in the world did you come up with an idea like that? The Bible. (laughs) Boy, that was hard, wasn't it? You, You know what the Bible is? It's God's journal. The Bible is, watch this. It records two things. That's all. The Bible records two things. What two things does it record? What God said and what God did. That's right. That's what it records. It records what God said and it records what God did. There are two things that each and every one of us are known by and are judged by. You know what those two things are? What we say and what we do. Every one of you will be judged by what you say and by what you do. How many of you remember this old saying, actions speak louder than words? Okay? Actions, that's what we do. Words is what we speak. You remember this old phrase? Put up or... Shut up. Put up is what we do. Shut up is what we say. Now, everybody should journal every day. And as you're doing your own personal journal, there are two things that you should always write down in your journal. You should always write down what God is saying to you as you read your Bible. And secondly, you should always write down what God is doing in your life. I keep a notepad beside my, on my nightstand beside my bed. 
Now watch this. I, I, I'm really, I'm telling you this. I want to help you. Listen to me. That notepad is not on my nightstand because I'm a preacher. That was something that I started doing before I became a preacher. Because my grandparents, godly grandparents, my grandfather, godly man, a pastor all his life, he said, son, if you don't write down when God speaks to your heart, you will have a tendency to forget. Amen. Listen to me. I know that for some of you, what I'm talking about just comes natural. You write, you enjoy writing, you have a journal. Miss Stormer, do you have a journal? She will tomorrow. She <laughs> <laughs> Miss Becky, do you have a journal? Miss Angel, do you have a journal? Fancy has a journal. Are you pointing? You got a journal, Jordan? Okay, now watch this. So for some of you, when I say journaling, you, you say, wow, well, I'm already doing that. And there's others of you sitting here right now, and when I say you ought to have a journal and you ought to write down, you're probably thinking right now, huh, he might as well say build a rocket to go to Mars and back. <laughs> Well, listen to me. You're sitting there and you're thinking, why do I really need to do it? I've gotten along all these years without journaling. I, I mean, you know, preacher, I've been a Christian now for 45 years, and I hadn't journaled up to this point, so why do I need to start now? Here's why. And those of you that journal, I need some help. I need some help here. Now listen to me. Journaling, writing down what God is doing can actually be life transforming. It can, I'm telling you, listen to me. What, I, one thing that thrills my heart is when I take notes and I'm jotting, and I'm writing here and there. I, I, I have a folder that I keep everything in. And listen to me. Would you believe that in my folder I've got napkins from a restaurant? I was looking the other day, I got the, and I, something, God just done something there in the restaurant, so I wrote a note or two down on the back of the receipt. I have a drawer, a folder, just full of things, and listen, I can go back, and this blesses my heart, I can go back and pull out some of those notes, and I can look back five years ago, I can look back ten years ago, and I see what I was praying about, and I can see how God, and now I look, woo! I mean, it thrills my heart to look back and see what the Lord has done, and it encourages my heart so that when I'm faced in a battle, when I find myself in a battle, I can look back and I can say to my, and remind myself, Look, God's done it in the past, and I know he can do it in the present. It gives me hope. It gives me encouragement to see what the Lord has done. Amen. So I want to show you how to get started journaling. Here's how. You know what the first thing that all of us need to do? Is you all need to learn how to take notes during a sermon. Everybody should take notes during a sermon. Write down the scriptures that I give to you. Write down some of the illustrations that I share with you. Listen to me. If you can't follow along on the outline that I give you, just get you out a piece of paper. You might write it on the back of the bulletin. Listen to me. You will always retain more if you write it down rather than just sitting there trying to absorb. Amen. You retain a whole lot more when, when you write and take notes. Pray over what you've just written down. Pray over what God is showing you. Go home. Take the sermon outline home this week and take that sermon outline and say, Now, God, you gave me this on Sunday, but, Lord, I believe there's some more here. And dig and study the Scriptures for yourselves. Have a hunger for what God is giving you. Not only do you need to take notes during the sermon, but watch this. Some of you are going to pass out. 
Jot notes down in the margin of your Bible. I mean, listen, highlight, underscore, listen to me. It's okay to write in your Bible. Well, hey, watch this. It's your book. Amen. You own it. Come on. I mean, I keep my book, my Bible all marked up. God won't mind if you write in your Bible. It's amazing. I love to go back and look at notes that I've jotted down in the margins of my Bible. And I can to pretty well go back and tell you who preached this message and, and what God said. And I've got points written down. And again, it blesses my heart sometimes just to go through my Bible. I, I, I love, I have my grandmother's Bible. And my granny died in 1973. And, and after her death, my mama gave me her mom's Bible. And I have it in my office. It's old, it's worn out. But I love to go through and, and just look at all the things that my granny wrote. I remember one time right before she passed away, I, I had her Bible out one day and I was looking at it and she had T and P, T and P, T and P, all in her Bible. And I asked her, I said, Granny, what does T and P, whose initials are those? She said, oh, son, she said, I've tried it and I proved it. God is true, she said, to his word. Amen. I want, listen to me. My granny, her Bible is a blessing to my heart. In two, what, 2000, what is it, 18. Good gracious. She'd been dead since 73. I was thinking the other day, I wonder if my Bible is going to be a blessing to my children. I wonder if my Bible will end up being a blessing to my grandbabies one day. Amen. Something to think about. Amen. I'm telling you, a student of the Word. I didn't tell you how you know if you're a student of the Word. A student of the Word, look at their Bible. If they're a student, it's marked up and about worn out. Lord, help us to get this. If you'll start with taking sermon notes and writing in the margins of the Bible. If you'll do that on a regular basis, it won't be long. You'll start journaling. You'll start writing things down. So let me close. How can you have quiet time with the Lord? You need to reserve you a time and a place. You need to read your Bible. And you need to start recording all your thoughts. And then the last thing you do is this. You reach out in prayer. You need to reach out in prayer. After I've heard from God, after I've heard from God, now watch this, keep, keep it in the order, after I've heard from God, then I can't help but want to talk to God. I want to talk to Him. I'll expand and talk a little more about that next Sunday, but listen to me. One of the ways that I get, whoosh, when I get into the presence of God, I can't help but to thank Him for what He's told me. Amen. When I get into the presence of God, I can't help but to just thank Him for what He's doing in me. Amen. And when I get into the presence of God, I can't help but to praise Him for who He is. Amen. I want to keep, encourage you, not only do you need to journal, but you need to keep a prayer list. Everybody should have a prayer list. I keep a list. I have a prayer notepad on my desk. And I'm just sharing with you what's on my prayer list. Nothing, and I'm not going to share the specifics, but... But there's one page I keep a thing, a list of things that I pray for every day. 
One of the first things I pray for every day is I pray for my family Amen. and our personal needs. Amen. But you know the second thing I pray for every day, and this might shock you, but the second thing that I pray for every single day is my schedule for that day. Because I don't want anything to interrupt my schedule. I want to be obedient to the Lord. Amen. And if I don't pray over my schedule every day, I'm, listen, I've already hinted to this a moment ago. If I don't pray over my schedule every single day, the devil will see to it that I'm so busy that I don't accomplish what God's called me to do. But then I have a, a list of nothing but sick folk on that list. I pray for those that are sick and those that are su suffering. I have a third sheet on my prayer list, and I pray for all of our political leaders. I pray for our president. Amen. And I'm telling you, our leaders today need prayer more than at any other time. Amen. We need to pray for them every day. I pray, I have a list of spiritual leaders that I pray over. And then I have a sheet that I pray for just my friends every day. And I have a lot of people listed on that. Then I have another sheet. And there's nothing but marital problems. And I'm praying for marriages. I'm telling you, listen to me. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Amen. I'm telling you, we need to be people of prayer. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you do it. The important thing is this, that you be people of prayer. Amen. That you talk to the Father every day. God wants to hear from you. God wants to hear from me. And friend, listen to me. If you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. James said it like this. If we'll take a step toward God... I promise you, friend, God takes a step toward us. Amen. God wants to have fellowship with you and with me. Did you know the closer that we get to Jesus, the more those around us will see Jesus in us? <laughs> oh, let me tell you something. Did you know the more time that you spend together? I'm not living in my husbands and wives. Listen to me. The more y'all spend time together, the more you start acting like one another. It's amazing to me. A couple's been married for several years. And you even start looking like one another. Lord. <laughs> See, look at Brother Kyle and Miss Fancy. They kind of look like brother and sister. They just starting to look like one another. I think Russ and Becky favor. I do. I think y'all favor. <laughs> I think Ed and Debbie kind of they favor. Look at Brother Jimmy and Miss Francis. They look like twins. <laughs> it's amazing. The more time you spend with one another, you pick up one another's habits. You start acting like, you look like, you start talking like. You like the same things. Hello. You see, the more time we spend with our Father, you can't help but to act like him. The more time you spend with your father, listen to me, you're going to start looking like him and walking like him and talking like him. And the more time you spend with the father, it's going to have such an impact on you. It's going to, it's going to have such an effect on you that you can't help but to have, have an effect on everybody that's in your circle. Are y'all hearing this message this morning? You know the one thing that jumps out at me when I read the New Testament? I hear this and I close. 
when Jesus was on the earth. People just wanted to be with him. The rich, the poor, the good and the bad. Everybody wanted to be near him. People just wanted to, watch this, when Jesus showed up, people just wanted to touch him. Oh, there was such a magnetism about him. I'm telling you, when you're close to the Lord, people are going to want to be near you. People are going to want to be in your presence. Lord, would you help us today to reserve us a time and a place? Lord, would you help us today to be students of your word? God, would you help us to start writing and journaling and, and writing down what you're doing and what you're saying in our lives? God, help us to be people of prayer. I'm telling you, when we can do these four simple things, it's amazing. It will be amazing at your walk with the Lord. I asked my Sunday school class this morning, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the least, 10 being the greatest, what's your spiritual life like today? If I was to ask you to grade it on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the poorest and 10 being the greatest, where would you rate your spiritual walk? I don't think any of us are 10. And I would hope that nobody in the house was a 1. But one thing is true of every one of us. Nobody is where we ought to be. You know how I can tell? Look at all the empty seats in the house. Look at all of them. Because let me tell you something about Milldale. We got enough people that if they'd just be committed, we'd have to bring chairs out. We would. We'd have to bring the chairs out. How is your walk with the Lord? Let's pray together. I don't know about you, but I want to be up close. Boy, I want to be I want to be right on with the Lord. I want to be hitting on all eight cylinders. What about you today? How's your walk? I pray this morning the Holy Spirit spoke into your heart. And my prayer for you today is, first of all, if you're not here, never trusted Christ as your Savior, that you would come today. I'd be honored to pray with you. I'm telling you, the greatest thing you could do today is give your heart and your life to Jesus. If you're here today, but Christian and You've not been hitting on all eight cylinders. Not doing everything God's called you to do. I'm asking you today to repent. Ask God today to restore unto you the joy of 
your salvation. Some of you, you need that pep back in your step. Some of you need that spark to be fanned. Get that flame going brightly again. Some of you just need to recommit. Some of you need to come join our fellowship. You know this is where you need to be. We need your help. We need to serve and work together. There's a lot to do. And there's little time to get it done in. The altars are open. However the Holy Spirit's spoken to your heart, I'll be here. Don't wait. Come now. Come quickly. In Jesus' name. Would you stand with me? Our heads are bowed in attitude of prayer all over this house. Would you be obedient as Brother Kirk sings our invitation? Who'll come? Who'll come now? Come quickly. Jesus. Jesus, there's just something about that name. He's pastor, Savior, Jesus. Like a fragrance after He's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Continue to worship. It is time to worship Him and giving back to Him His tithes, our offerings. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for this message that you have given us.